evening. My name is Chris Plano, and I am a proud JW alum and manager of alumni relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for tonight's session. Get ready for tax season. Conquer your fear of filing. We're excited to bring you this program to help assist you in tackling a sometimes overwhelming topic, filing your taxes. We are grateful for tonight's faculty presenter for taking time out of her busy schedule to share her expertise and answer your questions directly. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. If you have questions for tonight's presenter, please add them to the Q&A section. They'll be answered at the conclusion of the program. The chat feature can be used to message other attendees as well. I'd now like to introduce tonight's presenter, College of Business Associate Professor Dawn Lopez. Dawn earned her bachelor's degree in business from Winthrop University, as well as an MBA in accounting and finance. After graduating, Lopez worked for a regional public accounting firm specializing in tax preparation for medical and law LLCs. Subsequently, Lopez served as an accounting manager for a multi-state environmental company and worked closely with several state government audit agencies. In 2004, Lopez joined JW Charlotte where she became the first campus controller and an integral member of the campus startup team. She provided guidance to the campus leadership team, coordinated accounting and audit functions with the university finance team, and was instrumental in developing many of the financial policies and procedures that still exist today. Lopez joined the College of Business as a full-time faculty member in the spring of 2009, and is an active member of the North Carolina Association of Certified Public Accountants the Institute of Management Accountants, and the Hospitality, Financial, and Technology Professionals. Please join me this evening in welcoming Associate Professor Dawn Lopez. Hi, everybody. How are you guys doing this evening? Hopefully, everybody can see me okay, hear me okay. Um, I am excited to be able to share some information with you this evening about taxes. And taxes is one of those things that we can't avoid. They can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit scary. So feel free to put your questions into chat and we'll reserve some time at the end of the session to be able to take some of your questions. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and bring up our presentation. Start this from the beginning, there we go. So um, again, Don Lopez, uh, CPA, CMA, those are my credentials there. The first thing I wanna start is with a little disclaimer, um, but a very important disclaimer. Every tax situation is different. So the information I'm gonna to provide to you this evening is general tax information, and it will probably be good information for the overwhelming majority, 80, 85, 90%, but every tax situation is different. And if you're not sure about a very specific question that you have, I will have some phone numbers at the end that are directly to different departments at the IRS, and you can always reach out to them to get some professional advice as well. The other thing I want to make sure that you know is our focus today is on federal taxes. The reason why I'm choosing to focus on federal is we all follow the same rules and guidelines when it comes to filing our federal taxes, but every state has their own state taxes as well. Um, as a matter of fact, seven states don't have any income taxes at all for states. So there's a lot of different rules and regulations and it would just be impossible to cover all 50 different states. The first thing I want to talk about tonight is that there's two really, really big areas that have changed in 2020 taxes. Now, keep in mind, the taxes we're filing is going to be for the year 2020. So it's everything that happened in your life from January 1st, 2020 to December 31st of 2020. And of course, we have to file those taxes and they have to be postmarked to the IRS by April 15th. Those two big situations that we um, are going to be looking at, here we go is first of all, 
um, a virtual currency declaration. Now you might be wondering what this is, but this year for the first year ever, right on the front page of your tax return document, the IRS is gonna ask you a question. It's a yes, no question, but it's gonna say anytime during the year 2020, did you receive, sell, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? Of course, what they're talking about is Bitcoin and any other kind of virtual currency. Now, the question itself is not new. It was there last year, but it was kind of hidden several pages down. And it would have been really easy for somebody to say, oh, I didn't know that was there or I didn't see it. And um, they just didn't know. But the fact that the IRS is now putting this on the first page right after your name and address and your personal information, that's a cue that the IRS is getting serious about tracking who is dabbling in virtual currency. So I wanna give everybody kind of like a little warning and heads up that if you have received sold exchange virtual currency, make sure that you're appropriately disclosing that to the IRS because they're asking that question. The other item that's a really big change this year, although it may not seem like it, is this idea of charitable cash donations. So we know that you know, donating to various nonprofit charities um, is a good idea because of the philanthropic side of things. But sometimes the motivation for doing that is also that, hey, we get a tax write-off. But in the past, you would only get the tax write-off if you were doing what's called itemizing your deductions. If you were doing the standard deduction, you actually didn't get to write off any of those charitable donations. So for the first time ever, the IRS is saying they're going to let you take the standard deduction and they're also going to let you still write off the charitable donations um, up to $300 in cash. So it's not a big number, but it is a really big change, the fact that they are allowing you to do that. So I've already used some very tax specific words like deduction. And in order to help us get through the next, you know, 30, 35 minutes or so, I want to go ahead and talk about terminology. And very specifically, the terminology that I want to make sure that we're familiar with is the word deduction versus credit. They're not the same. They are, in fact, very, very different. So the definitions are there for you. A tax deduction lowers your taxable income. And so that is the number that we use to calculate taxes owed. The lower your taxable income, the lower your tax bill. So a deduction indirectly lowers your tax bill, but it's not a dollar for dollar. So for example, the deduction we just talked about, charitable donations, it will lower your taxable income by if, if you made $300 in donations, it'll lower taxable income by 300, but it doesn't take 300 off the tax bill. A tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in the actual tax that you owe. So it's where it comes up on your tax return. And so after you determine the amount of taxes you owe, the tax credit then comes off the bottom, it comes off dollar for dollar and you would subtract it. Let's look at the um, format of taxes. So this is the basic structure of the tax return. It starts out with the personal information, which um, we saw on that first page. And remember, there's gonna be a question now right after the personal information about virtual currency. And then there's gonna be a whole lot of lines that are reserved for you to calculate your income from all of the different sources, including wages, interest, pension, social security, um, dividends, etc. Then you're going to take off what's called a standard deduction, or you can itemize, and that will give you your taxable income. And so this is the number that's going to be referencing the tax charts to determine how much tax that you owe. Then once you know how much taxes you owe or the refund, then we take off tax credits and we determine the amount of taxes at that point that's due or a refund. So we're gonna look back at this same basic structure again, but this time we're gonna put some numbers to it to hopefully make sure that that makes sense. So again, we're starting out with the personal information, so your name, address, et cetera. In my hypothetical situation, I have my income from all sources is $100,000. I am going to take the standard deduction of 12,400. That is the standard deduction in the year 2020 for um, single filers. And so 100,000 minus 12,400 is 87,600. That's just simple math. 
So based on the tax tables that are provided for 2020, that means the total tax I would owe is $15,103. And then I look at tax credit. By the way, any amount that your employer withholds from your check, they pay that directly to the IRS in your behalf, and that comes here under tax credits. If you pay a dollar in, you want credit for that dollar. And then in this situation, since I have $18,000 of credits um, and I only owed $15,000, I would now be getting a refund of $2,897. So this is the simple basic structure of how the taxes look and how they work. I mentioned the standard deduction. This is the standard deduction tables for the year 2020. If you are um, filing status of single, your standard deduction will be the 12,400 like you just saw. Married filing joint, it's exactly double that. And then you also have a couple of other filing statuses you can choose such as married filing separately and head of household. So even if you take the standard deduction, see taking the standard deduction means you are basically telling the IRS, listen, I just wanna make life simple. I don't wanna list out all of my deductions and deductions would include things like mortgage interest and property taxes. And um, so there's some other things that are in there, maybe healthcare expenses and um, unreimbursed um, job expenses like mileage. So you're telling the IRS, I don't wanna to have to add all those up and keep receipts for all that stuff. I'm just gonna take the standard deduction. Even if you take the standard deduction, the IRS still lets you take a few other deductions in addition. They say, even though you're taking the standard, there's a few other things. So a big one, particularly for our alumni, is student loan interest. You can still deduct up to $2,500 in student loan interest. You can also deduct after tax contributions to health savings plans. Um, alimony, that's a little bit of a tricky one. If you're paying child support, child support is never tax deductible. And on the receiving end, it's never considered taxable income. But up until the year 2018, the IRS said, if you're paying alimony, you get to take a tax deduction and the person receiving it would actually have to count that as income. So if you're divorced before 2018, alimony is a deduction. If your divorce decrees after 2018, um, you waited a little too long. I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, child support though is never a tax deduction. And then the charitable contributions that we talked about a few slides ago, the IRS is now gonna let us take up to $300 in charitable contributions, um, even if we are taking the standard deduction. So those are some additional deductions. Let's take a look at those credits. There are some tax credits that you can take. Of course, anything that you pay to your employer that's gonna go on your, or through your employer, that's gonna go on your tax return as a credit. Um, educational credits. Hopefully you already know this, but there are two educational credits that have been around for a little while now. There's the AOC, which is the American Opportunity Credit, and the LLC, which is the Lifetime Learning Credit. Now they both work a little bit differently. Um, they both have some rules and regulations, some income limits, but the American Opportunity Credit, you can only take for four years. So if you took it, or if a parent took it in your behalf while you were pursuing your bachelor's degree, you may have already maxed out that credit. However, if you are now pursuing your master's degree, um, or you're still going to school to pers uh, pursue perhaps another degree, you do have to be in an accredited institution, you might want to look into the lifetime learning credit. By the way, both of these educational credits are really, really awesome credits because as I mentioned, credits come off the bottom and they're refunded um, dollar for dollar. Educational credits, very, very few credits work this way, what I'm about to tell you, but educational credits is one of them. And I will tell you, when my son was going to school and he was going in Florida, um, the amount of taxes that he owed, let's just I'll give you a hypothetical number, he owed $2,000 in taxes, but he got an educational credit of $4,000. And so he actually getting, ended up getting back a refund from the IRS that was bigger than the taxes that he paid in. And so we call these credits refundable credits, which means you can actually 
get back more than what you put in. Some credits kind of stop you at zero. They say, well, you can't go negative, okay? They stop you at zero. But there are a few credits, like educational credits, that you can actually get back more from the IRS than you gave to the IRS during the year. So I think that's a pretty cool thing to know. Some other credits include child and dependent care expenses. Notice it's not just child care. If you are actually caring for an aging parent or grandparent, as long as they meet a relationship test through the IRS, if you are paying expenses to help with their care, that is also a tax credit you can take. Up to $1,050 for one dependent, up to $2,100 for two dependents. Um, adoption credits, it's up to $14,300. Uh, that you can get back in expenses that you've incurred um, in an adoption process. And then what's also new this year, being that 2020 was such an interesting year indeed, is the stimulus check that you did not get. A lot of people are wondering, what about my check that I never got? What's going on with that? So I mentioned 2020 was a very special year. Um, it was, this is what's making taxes this year kind of complicated. There's a lot of things that are coming up in the year 2020 that we've not seen before. We have economic income payments, which is those stimulus checks. We have a record number of Americans that have received unemployment this uh, in the year 2020, including a federal supplement um, from additional dollars to the unemployment checks. And then we have millions of Americans working from home in numbers that we've never seen before. So we're gonna talk about each one of these things and how it might impact your tax situation for the 2020 filing year. Before I get into each of those things, I just thought I would share with you some of the legis this is just some of the legislation that was passed in the year 2020 that's having an impact on our taxes. And you may have heard of some of these in the media, the CARES Act, that's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Securities Act. And in the CARES Act, it was through that legislation that Americans received economic, in uh, economic impact payments. Now in the year 2020, if you are eligible and if you got an economic impact payment, boy, try to say that six times real fast, right? Um, if you got a stimulus check, that's a lot easier. It was paid out as $1,200 to each individual and then $500 for each qualifying child. Now, um, how did the IRS know who to send it to? What they did is they went back to their records and they identified who would qualify based on the taxes that were filed for the 2019 year. If they didn't have anything on file for you for the year 2019, then they went back to 2018 and then they looked at that. So it wasn't a perfect system, but they were trying to get dollars out quickly. And so in some cases they got dollars out that shouldn't have been, and in other cases they may have missed people. So we're gonna talk more about that in just a moment. Um, but looking at the legislation first, the CARES Act also created a Paycheck Protection Program, which was low interest loans to eligible small business owners that helped them cover payroll and other expenses for up to 24 weeks. And in um, some cases, those loans were able to be forgiven. Um, it also is what created that change we saw on one of the early slides about the above the line charitable contribution. Basically through the CARES Act, the IRS was trying to, or Congress was trying to inspire Americans to still be giving and to still donate, even if you're taking the standard deduction to give you some sort of motivation to make some charitable contributions to organizations that may need it. It also eliminated penalties for early withdrawal of IRAs and 401ks. I have this on here because I feel it's um, my responsibility to tell you that it did this, but I also have to tell you that I never, never recommend um, withdrawing dollars early from an IRA or 401k unless an absolutely last resort. We could do another entire seminar on why I think that and why it's a bad idea, but I will tell you that um, for the year 2020, if you can demonstrate that the reason you had to make a withdrawal from your retirement account was due to effects of the coronavirus, the IRS did eliminate the penalties for doing that. 
There's also a Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and then the SECURE Act, which was setting up every community, set, setting every community up for retirement enhancement. So this is just some of the legislation um, that has come up and affected some of the rules and regulations and how we put together our taxes for the year 2020. So I said we were going to talk about some of those issues that I think might be affecting our alumni directly and specifically, and we've been talking about the stimulus check. So what about that stimulus check? The way I see it, there's three different possibilities, right? You got a check, and it's exactly what you expected, and all is good. You went on. You got a check but you weren't expecting it. It's kind of a surprise and you think you got it in error. So what's the deal with that? Or what I've heard a lot of is you did not get a check and you feel like you should have gotten one. So let's take these one by one briefly and kind of break them down. First of all, if you got a check, then it's exactly what you expected and all is good. There's not much to talk about. Everything is squared away. If you got a check in error, here's something interesting. The IRS has actually recently come out and said, for the most part, they're not going to ask you to pay it back. Now, you might be wondering, how would you get a check in error? There's a couple of situations that have come up. If you have a dependent child and you've got two parents and the parents are no, maybe they were never married, maybe they're no longer married, but you've got mom and you've got dad. And there's, but there's only one dependent child. There's a possibility that both parents got the dependent uh, payout of the $500. The IRS has said they're not going to go to the other to the parents and make one of them pay it back. Or let's say, remember I told you how the IRS determined your eligibility? They looked at your tax return from the year 2019. What if, because remember these had income limits, what if in the year 2019, you qualified, but in the year 2020, you got this new job, awesome new job or promotion, and now your income is so high, you would not have qualified. So if you legitimately qualified based on your 2019 taxes, but you would not have qualified if they knew how much money you were gonna make in 2020, and by the way, if that's you, like, awesome, I'm so glad to hear it, but the IRS is not gonna come back to you and say, hey, you made more money than we thought you would, so you gotta pay that back. So in those situations, they're not looking for their money back. But notice I put in most situations, and of course at the beginning I said every tax situation is different, right? So when are they looking for the money back? Well, if in 2019 you had a married couple that filed their taxes, but then in the year 2019, perhaps one of them passed away. And so you got a stimulus check for someone that actually was not alive in 2020, or let's say you got two checks. I don't know, maybe you filed your taxes and then you filed an amended return and something got mixed up at the IRS. And so they sent you two checks. In those cases, they probably are going to come looking for their money. So if they sent dollars to someone that is no longer alive or they sent the check twice, they probably are going to be looking for that back. And then, of course, the big question that always seems to come up, what if you didn't get a check that you should have? You don't know how you got missed. You don't know what got missed, but you should have. Um, in a previous slide, when we talked about all those different credits, there is actually going to be a, a, a place on your taxes about the recovery rebate credit. And remember, I said that those are refundable dollar for dollar. So if you didn't get your $1,200, you're going to be able to put it on your tax return as a, as a um, tax credit. It would be the same as if you had paid it to your employer and it was reported on your W-2s. You're going to get that back. And that is also a refundable credit. So even if it puts you in a situation where you're going to end up getting more back in taxes than you paid in, the IRS is going to allow that. And you're going to be able to put that on your taxes as a credit. By the way, um, Everything I'm talking about is for that $1,200 check. Most of you got another check in January for $600 per person. It was $600 for each person and $600 for each dependent child. Um, but no one got that $600 before January. Those were not released until the beginning of January. What that means is we're going to be dealing with stimulus check payments and how to handle them on our taxes again for the year, 2020, year 2021. So uh, this is not an issue that's going to be going away anytime soon. How about um, 
people that were on unemployment. Uh, first of all, unemployment benefits are subject to federal taxes. Now, different states handle things differently, but federal, on a federal level, where we all have to follow the same rules, unemployment benefits are subject to federal taxes. Now, hopefully you knew that up front when you were collecting those dollars and you checked the little box that said, yes, please withhold taxes so you don't find yourself with a big tax bill at the end of the year. The federal government treats unemployment dollars just as if you went to work and earned the dollars. Now, some states do not tax unemployment compensation benefits, and they are listed there for you, uh, including Alabama, California, Montana, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And then in addition to those states, there's even more states, another nine states, that don't tax income at all. Alaska, Florida, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Dakota, Tennessee, Washington, Wyoming. By the way, a little side note about Alaska. They're the only state in our all 50 states that they have no income tax, no property tax, and no sales tax. So think about that for a moment. Um, they're certainly trying to entice people to move to Alaska. In addition to uh, no taxes on any of those items, they actually pay each one of their citizens a check each year based on X number of dollars times the number of people in the household. So I just think that's a little interesting side note about Alaska. We'll talk more about that maybe some other time. Um, what if you didn't have taxes withheld? from your unemployment checks. It's not great news, but there's some really important information that I wanna make sure that you know. First of all, don't think you can hide from the problem. Your taxes have to be filed by April 15th. They have to be postmarked by April 15th. There's no exception to the rule. Um, well, you can file for an extension. However, if you owe any money, it's still based on April 15th. So they have to be filed. The IRS has come out and said, because they know that for some people, it's gonna come as a big old surprise. What, I owe how much money? So what they have done is they have said, okay, we won't charge any interest or any penalties from April 15th to July 15th. But by the way, if you don't file by April 15th, you will be charged a late filing penalty and they're not waiving that. So get your taxes filed, uh, face the piper and eventually pay the piper. Okay, what you should know is the IRS will work with you. They offer installment plans on balances up to $50,000 and they'll let you pay that off over six years. They will work with you. Under no circumstances should you get a home equity loan, put it on your credit card, borrow money from somebody. You should not borrow money to pay your tax bill under any circumstances. Because first of all, the IRS, their interest rate is only 3%. And I think you're gonna be hard pressed to find a lower rate than that. Occasionally you might get one of those interest-free offers from a credit card. But if you look closely at those offers, they charge you some money up front for doing them. And it's usually for a limited amount of time. And the other thing that's important to note is if you do have this IRS payment plan you're working on, it will not show up on your credit report. So if sometime during this loan repayment process, you want to try to um, get a loan to buy a house or to buy a car, you won't have that hanging over your head as a liability. You knew I had to throw an accounting term in there being an accounting professor at Johnson & Wales, right? Liabilities, those things that we owe. So get your taxes filed. No penalty will accrue from April 15th to July 15th. They're giving you a few months to get it figured out. They will work with you on an installment plan and their interest rate is low. It won't show up on your credit report. Now, where are all my people working from home, right? I am, that's not Johnson & Wales in the background. Um, this is home and I've been doing my classes from home since March 10th or so of 2020. So what do you think? Should I be able to take my lovely dining room area as a home office exemption or deduction? Should I be able to write off some expenses? I've been getting a lot of questions about that. People wanna know what can they write off because they've gotta pay for their cell phone and their internet. So here's the deal. Um, if you work for someone else, 
and I do, I work for Johnson and Wales, but if you work for someone else and you get a uh, W-2 from an employer, you are not eligible to take a home office deduction of any kind. You're just not eligible, okay? And that rule, by the way, changed in 2017. You used to be able to take some home office deductions, but in 2017, what happened, remember that standard deduction we looked at before that was 12,400? It used to be half that amount. It used to be only like $6,000. And if you wanted to deduct more than six, you had to itemize all these deductions like mortgage interest and property taxes and home office and uh, charitable donations and healthcare expenses. So in 2017, what the IRS did is they doubled that standard deduction, but then they took away a bunch of all those little things that you would previously able to, to deduct and home offices was one of them for people that are working for someone else. Now, there are a few states, again, I'm trying to keep this focused on federal, but I do wanna talk about there are a few states that will allow a resident to claim unreimbursed business expenses on their state return. Again, this will not be on federal, but your state return. And those states are listed for you there, Alabama, Arkansas, again, California, Hawaii, Minnesota, New York, and Pennsylvania. The better option, if you find that you are working from home, and you feel that you're really incurring a lot of expense, maybe it would be a good idea to have a conversation with your employer and ask if they will reimburse something. First of all, when an employer reimburses you, that is not taxable money because that's not considered income. It's not income you earn. It is, in fact, a reimbursement. So if you can get an employer to, you know, kick in $40 a month towards your cell phone bill or kick in $50 a month for the internet bill or paper, pens, whatever, that is not going to be a taxable item to you. It will provide you a greater benefit because if your employer gives you $50, you're getting the benefit of the full $50, right? But if the IRS would go back to 2016 rules and allow you to deduct it, it's going to be in those above the line deductions. So you're not actually going to get a dollar for dollar um, credit for it anyway, because it's not a credit, it's a deduction. And by the way, just a little bit of research, I started to get curious um, how many employers are actually, in fact, providing financial support for employees that are working remotely. And the answer to that question is only about 38%. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because employers are trying to kind of cut costs or if it's because employees simply are not asking the question. Um, but if you feel that you are incurring a lot of expenses and you're working for someone else, um, you cannot do it on your taxes. Your best bet is to have a conversation with your employer. So I keep saying if you work for someone else, but what if you don't work for someone else? What if you are self-employed? Um, I know we have a lot of entrepreneurial students at Johnson & Wales, and if you're self-employed or an independent contractor, then yes, you can take a home office deduction, but there are some rules. First of all, you can only deduct expenses for the portion of your home that is used exclusively and regularly for business, exclusively and regularly. So if your dining room is your home office during the day, but it's where you have dinner in the evening, you're not going to be able to take a home office deduction for that. Your home has to be your principal place of business. And anything that you use, both in work life and home life, cannot be a home office deduction. So if you have a computer that you're using for work, but you've also got Facebook on it and um, you know Twitter and Instagram or whatever else, you've got your Amazon account on there, you're not gonna be able to write off the cost of that computer. If you're using your internet connection to buy things on Amazon or connect to that Facebook account, you're not gonna be able to write off that internet expense. Same thing with cell phone. If you've got a cell phone exclusively for work, yes. But if you have one that you make both personal and business calls on, then no. So the IRS is really kind of cracked down on these home office deductions. So if you use it in work life and home life, the answer is no. And again, it has to be just the portion of the home that's exclusive and regularly for business. So what does that mean? It means if you have a 1,000 square foot home and you have a 10 by 10 room, so 100 square feet, that that's the office and that's all you do. That means 10% of your home is an office. And so then you would do a proration and you'd be able to take that 10% of some of your home expenses.
I will tell you that home office deductions are a big IRS um, audit flag. And so I think you should always take every deduction that you're entitled to. That is your prerogative and you absolutely should. But you should also be aware that they are very strict about it and it is an audit flag. And I think by the way, that's where we're going with virtual currency. I think that's why it's on the front page and that's why I'm giving you the heads up now. So I said that this is general information and every tax situation is different. This is some phone numbers for you. Um, they are direct to the IRS. Um, the IRS, believe it or not, they're actually happy to take your call to answer calls. They will give you, gen they will give you advice. You can talk to them specifically about economic income uh, impact payments. There's a number on there if you have questions about your individual taxes, but if you call them and you're asking them about your business or state taxes, they're gonna tell you that's not the right number. You can also go onto the IRS website and you can search online to find the closest office and you can schedule and set up an appointment online. And most of their offices are actually seeing people um, even though we are in the middle of COVID. Most of their offices are open and they are working with seeing people. One final note that I wanna make Yes, your taxes have to be filed by April 15th, but the IRS actually has come out and recently said that they're not going to process or review anybody's tax return until February 12th. So that's a little bit later than usual. So my, my mom texted me uh, the other day, actually, and she said, I've got all my tax stuff. Will you do my taxes? And I said, yes, I will, but I, I'm probably not going to get it to it for a week or so. And right, but I now want my refund. And I was like, Mom, they're not gonna they're not gonna start looking at it till February 12th. And so if you're one of those people that you file really early all the time and you're used to getting that refund check, you know, pretty quickly, don't be alarmed if it's a little bit delayed because they are not, even if you file electronically, it's gonna go into a holding pattern and they're not gonna look at that until April 12th. So those are phone numbers um, for the IRS. We're gonna reserve the rest of this time where you can ask questions, uh, not of the IRS, but of me. And if I can help you in any way or answer questions for you, I'm happy to do that. I believe that some of our other moderators have been managing and moderating um, questions you may have put in through chat. So let me, I think just stop the, sh the share and so, and ask um, Chris if you've got any questions that have come up. Um, absolutely, Professor Lopez, thank you so much for that engaging and informative presentation. Boy, did I, did I learn a lot over the last 40 minutes here or so and touch it on those hot button topics, the CARES Act and the topic on everyone's mind, stimulus checks. Thank you so much. That was a great, great presentation. And boy, do we have some, questions waiting in the queue for I'm so you. Nervous. <laughs> you I'm not even gonna lie. I'm so nervous. So we um, have touched upon a couple of them already, but we have a good number of for, for you. So we're gonna get right to it with the questions. Perfect. I know alumni are waiting. First question, um, for multiple jobs, how would you fill out a W-4 form? So W-4 forms, if you've ever asked your employer for advice on this, your employer probably wasn't very helpful. And I want to make sure that you're not too hard on the employer for that. Actually, legally, they're not allowed to give you advice on how to fill out the W-4. So all a W-4 does is it tells the payroll system how to withhold taxes. Okay, and so the higher number you put on a W-4 form, the more taxes they're going to take out. Now, if too much taxes are withheld, you're going to get it all back. Me personally, I don't like giving more money to the IRS throughout the year. I, I, I'm not one of those people that are happy when I get a refund, because if I get a refund, it means I've given a loan interest-free to the government for the last year, and, and I don't feel like giving them an interest-free loan. So if I had multiple jobs, how would I fill out that W-4 form? Personally, on the first one, your primary job, I would be, you know, as, as honest as you can, I would say, you know, you've, it, it'll ask you, like, do you have a spouse? Do you have dependents? You know, all that kind of stuff. And you fill that out to get things exempted. And then on the other W-4s, I would probably put a little bit of a higher number so that it 
reduces the amount of taxes they withhold because your jobs aren't talking to each other. There's nothing behind the scenes where your job, like job A knows how much job B is withholding. And, and hopefully that answer makes sense. So remember W-4 is just a way for a payroll system to know how much to deduct. The more it deducts, you know, the more you're giving to the government, so. All right, great question. All right, next question. Um, I'm single and have no dependents or a house or anything tricky on taxes, but I always seem to owe dollars each year for taxes. I have two jobs. What can I do to make sure not to owe each year? I currently claim single zero for both jobs. Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, I'm jealous. <laughs> You're single and no kids. What the heck? <laughs> so <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but um, if it seems like you always owe taxes, it's interesting because I would have gone right back to the W-4 question. I would have said, again, it's based on how much is getting withheld. And but you already clarified something by saying, I claim single and zero. If you know up front that you're owing taxes, there's actually another line on the W-4. And on that other line, you can actually request additional dollars to be withheld. And so taxes are really just a numbers game. And it sounds like um, that, you know, between the two jobs, you're probably making a pretty decent income. If you're claiming zero deductions on both W-4s, and it's still not enough being withheld to cover the tax liability that you have at the end of the year, then you probably need to adjust your W-4 with each one of your employers and or at least one of them and ask for an additional, you know, based on however much that you end up owing, have an additional $100 withheld from each paycheck, $200. You do need to be careful because if you owe too much, um, you know, so because sometimes people think, oh, I'll fill up my W-4 and I'll, you know, put 20 and I'll have no taxes withheld. You can do whatever you want, but if you owe too many dollars in taxes at the end of the year, by too many, uh, most state limits are $1,000 and federal, it's a few thousand dollars, but if you owe more than that, and that happens more than two years in a row, you're actually going to be charged a penalty on your tax return. And so, because just like I don't like to give the government an interest-free loan, they don't like to give me money interest-free either and say, oh, you could just pay us everything you owe in April. It doesn't work like that. The goal with the W-4 is to get you as close to the tax liability as you will actually be. So if you already have that heads up and you know you owe every year, you know it, it kind of, it's kind of an answer that stinks and, and I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but really there's no other way around it um, except for increase your withholdings or you know quit one of your jobs. Yeah. Oh, great answer, great answer. And thank you alumni, the questions are flying in. My alumni are doing a great job here. I think this is an easy one that we can knock out quick, Professor Lopez. Do church donations count as a deduction? Absolutely. As long as your church is not like the church of Don Lopez, your church has to be a legitimate um, nonprofit entity, a 501c3 in your church. It, you know, if you pay them in a trackable way via, you know, a uh, Automatic, automatic payments to the church or checks, they should be giving you a tax form at the end of the year showing those contributions that you've made. But because a lot of people do just drop 20 bucks in the bucket, you know, on their way in, um, you, you can still deduct, you know, your charitable contributions to the church. And that's going to be, if you do the standard deduction, that's going to be part of that above the line deduction you can take now up to $300. Okay, excellent, excellent. Here's another one. I started working recently as an independent contractor teaching cooking tutorials virtually. Can I claim the food items I purchase as a business expense? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what's gonna happen is if you're an independent contractor, you work for yourself, there's gonna be a separate piece of paper, um, a schedule C that goes with your taxes. And it's gonna look a whole lot like the income statement that you learned in your accounting classes. So it's gonna have your revenues and then it's gonna have your expenses. And all of that, th this is different than the home office ex ex expense that I was talking about. The home office expense is about, you know, your home internet and your phone, but, 
when you have a business, it doesn't matter if it's cooking tutorials or dog sitting or washing cars or whatever, you have your revenues and you have your expenses. I'm assuming your business is a sole proprietorship. And so what will happen is at the very end of that schedule, you're going to have your revenues, you're going to have your business expenses. And then at the bottom, you're going to have your net income or net loss. That number will then get transferred over to your main um, tax return page. And it'll be, there'll be just a line. It's going to say, do you have, you know, a plus or a minus for, you know, so sole proprietorship business. And then that number goes on there. But you need that Schedule C behind the scenes, you know, for your supporting documentation. So absolutely the food that you're buying for, you know, that business that you are doing, first of all, hats off to you and uh, the food and, and any other expenses that you're buying for that. If you bought yourself a nice new chef uniform, if you bought some new chef knives, uh, any expense, not just food, any expense, got some new cookware, all of that should be itemized on your business expenses. Okay, great, great. More questions are coming in. Here's one. I live in the state of Florida. I've never gone through this situation before. I received unemployment. I don't remember checking the box to have taxes removed. Should I brace myself for paying money back? Yep. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I, I feel like I'm supposed to give a longer answer, right? The answer is no. yes. Yes, you should pay, brace yourself. So Florida doesn't have a state income tax, you know, you know, lucky you. Um, but you're not going to be able to escape federal taxes. Now, maybe, maybe you're going to get lucky. Um, maybe you don't remember checking the box and you did. Maybe something in the state of Florida and the processing, they took it out anyway, even if you didn't check the box. But um, if you did not pay taxes on those dollars, you are going to owe federal taxes on those dollars. Okay. Here's and the next still question. File, still file, still file by April 15th. It doesn't matter, right? Like not filing doesn't make the bill go away. Absolutely. Here's the next question, a very good one here. I'm in a master's program currently and they pay half of my tuition and my half automatically, my other half com automatically comes out of my paycheck, but my college does not have any 1098E documentation for me. What should I do? Um, first of all, shame on your college for not providing a 1098E uh, or a 1098 form for you. I think it's actually a 1098T um, for tuition. You can still claim those tuition expenses even if they don't have the form. When you're doing the tax return, there's a box that says, you know, the school would not provide it for me or they don't have it. So first call the school and make sure that they in fact will not or cannot provide you with a 1098T before you check that box. And um, if in fact they don't have it, you can still claim those expenses on your taxes. Um, and, but they're gonna ask you the name of the school, the address of the school, you know, is the school accredited? Are you at least a half-time student? And let the IRS deal with the school because that's something that the school should be doing. So shame on them. Um, but just so you know, when your employer is paying part of your tuition, up to $5,250 a year, that is actually not a taxable benefit to you. So that is like free, like not taxed money to you. So that's awesome when employers do that. If the other half is actually coming out of your paycheck, you have really, really good proof and verification um, that is showing that you're paying those expenses, but maybe to someone listening that it doesn't, that they don't get, you know, their employer paying or it doesn't come out of their paycheck, um, you get a tuition bill. So it's really pretty easy to prove if you get a tuition bill and you're in class and you're getting credit, it's pretty easy to prove that you've paid those expenses. Now you mentioned it's a master's program. I just also wanna remind you and recommend that you look into the educational credits. Specifically, you're gonna be looking at the LLC lifetime learning um, credit because I am assuming that during the mass, that during your bachelor's program, you already maxed out your American Opportunity Credit. However, if you didn't max out the American Opportunity Credit, that does tend to be the better one of the two. It gets you back the most dollars. You can only claim one or the other. You can't double dip. But if you've already maxed out the American Opportunity Credit, that's fine. Absolutely. Um, look at that LLC, the lifetime learning credit. Okay. 
Um, next question, and they're still flying in, Professor Lopez. Hopefully this will be a quick one. Is the PUA portion of unemployment benefits taxable? I have no idea. <laughs> so how fast is that for you? Um, what is the PUA portion? I'm not sure I even know what the PUA portion is. Okay. Are you talking about the fe the federal the federal subsidy of that? Is that what? They may be. I'm I'm not sure. I was just reading the question verbatim. Right. Uh, maybe we can come right. back. We can have an answer for them even even post event here for that particular. Okay. I, I I'll make a note and I'll definitely get up. If the PUA portion, if that's it's an acronym for something that's referring to the federal um, additional supplement that was paid. Like we've all heard about how, you know, you get unemployment plus that extra $600 a week. That's what a lot of people are getting. That is still taxable. Right, so, yeah, the pandemic, right here we go. Pandemic unemployment assistance. Yeah, that is, that is the Fed. So unemployment is run by states. And, and by the way, I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna collect unemployment. I paid into it all these years. Just a little FYI, none of us sitting here have ever paid into unemployment. Unemployment is actually an insurance that's paid by the employer. That's why the company historically never wanted you to file for unemployment because their insurance rates were based on how many claims were made, just like your car insurance, right? The more claims you make, it's like the higher your insurance premiums are gonna be on your car. Well, that's the same thing with employers. And so um, traditionally and historically, unemployment has always been a state issue. Well, states were going bankrupt with the number of people that were filing for unemployment. So the federal government through that CARES Act, they kicked in and they said, we're going to give an additional subsidy, that additional $600 a week. And yes, that additional is taxable. Okay, there we go. I got a stimulus check question here. What if both married couples are alive and one of them received both stimulus checks. Will the IRS ask for the money back? I'm not sure I understand that question. So you got a husband and a, are they married? It's married, filing, right. joint? Yeah, it says, yeah, they're married couple, they're alive, but one of them received both stimulus checks. Yeah, hmm. so it's $1,200 per person. So they got $2,400. So one person got both and then the other person got nothing, I'm assuming. And if that's the case, you got exactly what you're supposed to get. You did married filing joint and you got a joint $2,400. So if that answers the question. Now, if one, if you did married filing joint, if one person got 2,400 and the other person got 1,200, that's a double payment. Mm -hmm. Right. So they probably wanna check with their accountant then when you think on that one filing. If they got a 2,400 plus a 1,200, yes. But if, if married filing joint, you got one check for 2,400, that's exactly what you're supposed to get. Just like this, think about in years past when you got a tax refund, a married couple would file their taxes, but the refund, you know, when you would get a refund check, not auto deposit, the refund check, it comes as just one check. It comes jointly because you filed your taxes jointly. Right, okay, very good. Here's a good one. How long do you have to amend taxes? I have a new accountant and I need to amend several years of losses for real estate. Currently a, a school teacher and I also have a small business. Mm -hmm. So for personal taxes, you can amend them for three years. So you can go back, so 2020 are the taxes that are due now. You can also go back and amend 2019, 18, and 17. So you can go back that far. Now, business taxes, if you file um, separate business taxes, those can be amended a little bit further back. I don't remember the exact number, but it's interesting because business losses are handled differently than personal taxes. Business losses can be carried backwards or carried forward. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. They, business losses can be carried backwards or forwards. I was going to get into uh, Donald Trump's tax situation, but have decided not to. <laughs> okay. I'll just leave it at that. I That's. Um, I understand. Another stimulus question. Stimulus questions. Hot topic here. Um, my daughter received her stimulus check, but then had a newborn child in November. 
how would we properly fill out that information and what amount would we put in? So she had a child in November of 2020, I'm assuming. I'm presuming so, so yes. Yeah, yes. So that's a dependent. And so she's going to be eligible for that stimulus credit. And so that, that will be on the tax return itself. And dependents were eligible to get $600. And by the way, the IRS doesn't get into dates. It's whatever the status is as of December 31st. So if you have a child on December 31st, they qualify as a dependent for that whole year. Doesn't matter if they were born in January or December. So whoever put in that question, you are eligible for an additional $600 for the dependent child. And that would go on your tax return. Doesn't matter if you itemize deductions or take the standard, that's gonna be a credit. And that's an additional $600 that's gonna go in your pocket. So if you're already getting a refund, it's gonna increase your refund by $600. And if you owe the IRS, it's gonna reduce the amount you owe by $600. Oh, okay. Very good. All That's right. the rebate recovery credit. Sure. Okay. Here's another, another stimulus question. How can someone claim their stimulus check if they do not have a tax return to fill out? Hmm. Fill one out anyway. You, you, you can file. I, I don't know what that means by I don't have a tax return to fill out. First of all, right. there was a number um, and I actually do know some people that, you know, they hadn't filed tax returns for a couple of years. And there was a number before, when they, before they gave out these first round of checks, these $1,200 checks that you were able to call and say, hey, I kind of want to get on your radar. But if the IRS owes you money, they owe you money. So you're going to fill out your tax return the same way Um is anybody else's. It's that format I showed you. You're going to have your name, your address, your social security number, and where it says income, it's going to be a zero. If, if you're not claiming any income and you haven't worked or collected unemployment, your income is zero and your standard deduction is zero and the amount of taxes you paid in is zero. And then so at the bottom line, you're going to have how much taxes do you owe a refund? It's going to say zero and then it's going to be credits and you're going to have the, you know, uh, the, the stimulus rebate recovery credit, I'm getting the word wrong now, but that rebate or, or that stimulus recovery credit, and it's the $1,200. Um, the, the government did not put a stipulation on these $1,200 stimulus checks that you had to be a working citizen of the United States. That was not one of the requirements. It's not, it wasn't someone that you had to be um, someone that filed or paid taxes. The only limits they put on it were that you couldn't make over a certain amount of money. Well, if you weren't working, then you certainly wouldn't make over that amount of money. So you are actually still owed that credit. And so, fill out the tax return and send it in because you're still owed those dollars unless you just like to donate them and let the government keep them. Right. We don't want that to happen. No. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Professor Lopez, uh, real quick, we have six questions left in the queue, but we only have time for one more. Thank you alumni for the great questions, but we're going to have Professor Lopez uh, answer those questions offline that we do not get to this evening and get them to those appropriate alumni afterwards, but we do have time for one more and great questions this evening. Final question, can, um, in, your, in your opinion, what are your recommendations for low cost solutions for preparing and filing taxes? Oh, you know what? Um, I am not an accounting snob. I will honestly tell you TurboTax is just fine. So you can do some of those free online things, but TurboTax is pretty good because it's set up like an interview process and it's going to just, you know, ask you questions like, did you get a stimulus check? Um, do you have educational expenses? It's going to ask you questions as if you were sitting down and doing an interview. And TurboTax, the most basic version of it runs about forty or fifty dollars, and it allows you to e-file um, for free. If, if you're not a fan of using that, you can go into H and R Block. You can use online software. There's so many different ways. And honestly, if your taxes are simple enough, you can even call one of those phone numbers that I gave you with the IRS. I mean, they'll even help you put together your taxes. If you don't have a lot of stuff going on with like international investments and 
a lot of buying and selling of stock. So there's a lot of really inexpensive options that you can take advantage of for getting your taxes filed. The important thing is to get them filed and get them filed by April 15th. They do charge a penalty for not filing them by April 15th and it's not fun. And that's you know, throwing money away. Absolutely, April 15th, and it's gonna be here soon enough. And times are rolling by the months. I can't believe it's gonna be February next week. Well, Professor Lopez, thank you very much for, for your presentation this evening and, and answering all the questions. I know you have to do a few more offline and great questions from all the alumni this evening. And uh, it, it, this has been absolutely great. I would now like to turn the program over to Lori Zabata, Director of Alumni Relations for this evening's closing remarks. Thanks so much, Chris. And thank you, Professor Lopez for such an informative presentation. You shared so much important information that we can utilize when preparing our own tax returns or even when discussing our returns with our tax preparer. We so appreciate this. I'd like to also thank our alumni for joining us this evening. Taxes are inescapable for all of us, including businesses large and small. Employers need skilled and experienced graduates who can navigate this complex world. Right now, the College of Business is preparing students to take on a variety of roles across a range of industries. You can help support tomorrow's business leaders today with a gift of any amount directed to the College of Business in Charlotte. Not only will your donation help upgrade lab space and open doors to new real world learning experiences, you'll also boost JWU's national rankings, bond ratings, and industry reputation. Alumni donor participation is a key metric in all of these evaluations. And as they grow, so does the value of a JWU degree for current and future alums. Gifts of all amounts count towards alumni participation rates, and together our gifts add up to make a significant impact in the lives of JWU students following in our footsteps. If you're in a position to do so, please use the link in the chat window to support students in the College of Business. On behalf of our students, I thank you sincerely for your generosity. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's session, Get Ready for Tax Season, Conquer Your Fear of Filing, part of the JWU Connects Family of Programming. For the full listing of upcoming events, please visit our event calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. Thank you again for your attendance and have a wonderful night.